Uh, I'm Jesse Young. I'm the Vice President of Software Development at Zonar Systems. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about ground traffic control or logistics data with Cassandra. Um, really quickly, today we'll discuss an overview of who Zonar Systems is. As we know with Cassandra, we need to know what kind of data we're dealing with. Talk about some of the technical challenges that we've had at Zonar and why that's kind of led us into ca using Cassandra. I'll give a couple examples of how we're using Cassandra today and where we're going in the future. And then kind of the road to Cassandra and how we got to becoming using or got to, to be using Cassandra. Uh, so a quick overview of Zonar. We're a Seattle-based company. We deal with heavy fleet telematics. Now, what is that? Heavy fleet is any vehicle that's over 10,000 pounds or carries over eight passengers. That's our, our specific target customers. Um, we do deal with lightweight vehicles, uh, Ford F-150s, et cetera, but our, our main customer base is those heavy fleets. Uh, fleet telematics is just the collection of all the data from these fleets. GPS data, fault codes, um, any kind of data that's really gonna help those fleets function. And really what we are is a hardware-enabled software as a service company. What that is is we create a hardware device. It's a GPS, dev uh, GPS receiver with a GSM modem in it. Uh, we do uh, engine diagnostics and connect up to the engine computers of all these vehicles as well. And then we offer a SaaS-based uh, application for this. So we host all of the customers' data. We offer a web front end for those customers to get the data. And then we also offer a nice API for those customers to get the data and bring it into their back-end software. We know that APIs are huge. And that's something that we've always focused on. We're, we're an open source company similar to, 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 to Datastax and Cassandra users. We started out and really noticed that customers needed access to their data, and we wanted to make sure that we offered that to the customers. So what kinds of data are we really dealing with over at Zonar? Well, first and foremost, we started as a safety inspection company. We weren't dealing with GPS data to start. We're doing DOT required pre and post trip inspections. These are inspections that, that these drivers are required to do to make sure these heavy fleets or these heavy fleet vehicles are safe to be driving out on the road with all the rest of us commuters. We're now tracking GPS data in the last eight years. Um, this is a lot of data, latitude, longitude, heading, speed, all sorts of extra information that we're collecting about these vehicles just so that we can offer the best possible um, reporting to our customers. We're getting into uh, vehicle diagnostics. So we're actually tapped into the engine computer of these vehicles. And we're collecting all sorts of information, oil temperatures, stop engine lights, check engine lights, uh, really anything that's out there on that engine computer, we're able to collect and we're pulling that information and doing all sorts of fun analytics for our customers on that. Um, we're even starting now to get into photos. With our inspection device, we're about to release an Android tablet. Um, and when these drivers are out doing their pre- and post-trip inspections, we know that a, a picture is worth a thousand words. So rather than the driver trying to explain exactly what they're seeing is wrong with the vehicle, they're going to be able to take a photo. And this is just opening up a world of opportunities for us. So there's just all sorts of data that we're trying to collect and, and give uh, quick, fast reporting on. So some of the technical challenges we've had at Zonar. Again, we've been around for about 13 years. We've got over 100 database servers now. That's over 3,000 databases due to our, the way that we've sharded these databases. It's, it's a, lot of, a, a large amount of data. It, it now constitutes over 100 terabytes of data. So what's that start bringing into us? The big data issue. We've got all sorts of problems that we're trying to deal with. And although your typical RDBMS is capable of handling those, it's not always the best solution. We need fast data replication. And I need it easy to be done. Or I need, it, I need to be able to do it easily. Um, you know, I, I can do all sorts of replication with all the, the RDBMS tools out there, but they're not easy. They're not easy to administer. I need to maintain fast inserts and fast retrievals from the same data store. I don't need to have an OLTP database and a data warehouse. I need to be able to do all of these things in one fast place. I need to be able to horizontally scale easily. I have this, we have this done fairly well with RDBMSs now, but it's not as easy as just adding in a couple nodes, putting in some tokens, and being done with it. And uh, the last but not least is easy to administer. Uh, we want a system where we're not having to have constant DBAs. We don't want to have to continue adding system administrators and systems engineers just to scale out horizontally. Uh, so with our typical RDBMS, it just starts not being relevant anymore. It's got its place and it's a great solution, but we needed a, some, something better. So we got our big data solution is Cassandra. Uh, as we all know, Cassandra has built-in data replication. This makes it very easy to continuously add nodes, add data centers, 
add extra rings if we need more performance. We need that fast data insert. This is something that Cassandra's done very, very well at. Uh, same thing with fast retrieval of data. I can insert the data, I can pull it out all at the same time and have a very, very high throughput. It's very easy to administer. We've done this at Zonar for the last couple of years now. Uh, we have a 10 node ring that's running. My administrators very rarely have to do anything with it, and the only solution they typically have is restart the Cassandra service, maybe restart the, the server itself. Never any other issues beyond that. Um, one of the other things that we, we happened to, to come upon with Cassandra was the need for TTLs, and Cassandra supports this very well. We're dealing with some DOT compliance data and other data that our customers are required by law to keep around for a specific amount of time, but after that required amount of time, some of them don't want that data around. If you're putting that into a typical RD, RDBMS, you're having to do delete statements or partition the data a certain way, this causes a lot of problems, and then you have to do vacuum statements and all sorts of fun stuff like that. Um, we've just been able to avoid a lot of that with Cassandra by using TTLs. So some quick examples of how we're using Cassandra right now. We've got our photos uh, that we're just starting to collect. Now really for this, we needed cheap storage. As we start collecting millions and millions of photos, we don't want to put that on big expensive sands or anything that, that's just going to be cost prohibitive. Cassandra, we're able to use our commodity hardware, the data gets replicated, and it's relatively cheap. We can grow this capacity easily over time by just adding additional nodes. I don't have to buy all that uh, in, uh, initial infrastructure right up front. I can start out with three nodes, six nodes, and, and continue to grow it. And this is another area where those TTLs just make a lot of sense. Fo certain photos don't need to be around forever, so I don't want to have to continuously figure out what needs to be deleted, set the TTL when we store it, and the uh, and then the photos are gone when they're gone. Another big use case that we've got is elevation data. We're starting to get really big into analytics with the data we, we use. Uh, one of those, those key important factors for us was elevation data and knowing where these vehicles are traveling and what elevation they were at. This is a really large data set that our engineers have had to work on. Uh, it, the data gets loaded once to the system and then it's just read heavily. We might update this once every year if we have to, but elevations aren't changing around the world, very often at least. Um, so we just needed those very heavy reads. We found while we were looking into the solution that it was just going to be a really quick key-based uh, application. We needed it to scale per, per, for performance. We know that within the first year we're going to need to do bursts of up to 6,000 reads per second and do over 150 million reads per day. And that's just in the first year. As we continue to add more devices to our, to our system, that's even more reads and more, uh, more, more performance that we're going to be able to, need to be able to do. We've got another application that we've ju uh, jumped into, which is ZPass. And what this is, is tracking bus ridership. So we need to know when people are getting on vehicles and getting off of the vehicles. We need to know that these vehicles are being utilized to their fullest capacity. If you've got a bus riding, driving around with five, ve five passengers in it, you're not being very economical with your, your vehicle or the fuel that you're using. So for this, we needed to be able to read and write very heavily at the same time. These are very small bursts of traffic uh, throughout the day, typically two big peaks throughout the day. Uh, a lot of people don't ride the bus at midnight or, or early in the morning. It's, it's typically a couple times throughout the day. So we needed a way for millions of users to actually access this data, and we needed to be able to do at least 20 million writes per day just in the first year again. We know as we continue to add vehicles and passengers, there's even more writes that are going to happen throughout time. We needed to be able to scale horizontally, the never-ending story for everybody. You want to be able to easily scale horizontally. So that was something that we really knew that Cassandra was going to be able to do. And one of the fun things for us was we just took a look at Twisandro. We've got a very basic app that re uh, reflects a, a Twitter-type feed. Twisandro is a big example that's constantly given out there. We were able to look at that code and, and adapt it and use it to help us uh, do some rapid development. So the road to Cassandra usage. It's kind of been a long road for us, and, and it, I, I'm hearing this reflected over and over again. The, the talk by Accenture kind of talked about this, and it was great to hear. Um, there's many resources out there for you to start using Cassandra. One of our system architects, uh, Josh Hanson, really started with data stacks, or with Cassandra early, early on. Way back in the days of Riptano, found this little uh, application that was out there open sourced, um, and just went to the first summit. Uh, and that's one of the, the key ways that, that you can continue learning about Cassandra and ways to utilize it. And you're all here, so you're already well onto that track.
Um, training and consulting has been really big with, for us. Uh, just getting some of those experts in there and being able to train us and help consult and, and show us the right way. And we've used data stacks uh, a number of times just to help us do that and do some data modeling. Um, we've had uh, Matt Dennis a few times come over to our, our offices and really help us. And not only just during those consulting times, but, but he's available in all or most of the data stacks in the Cassandra community through multiple uh, ways. There's the Planet Cassandra community that's out there that's really good. Um, I highly suggest you go to the meetups. Uh, those have been just great to, to get uh, more informed with the local community and people that can help you uh, locally. Twitter's another great resource for everyone to use. Um, we've got IRC. The IRC community is great for Cassandra. Uh, we've had plenty of times where we've asked questions in, on how to do specific things or issues that we've, we've occurred, uh, come across and had some great help there on IRC. Uh, one last thing that, that, that I'd like to point out too is, is a way that you can rapidly develop with uh, Cassandra, uh, specifically using DSE and AWS. And we found this to be really important for us. Using the AWS AMIs, we're able to quickly use uh, a couple Python scripts with about two or three lines each. Uh, we can bring up a DSE ring in five minutes. That could be a six node ring, 12 node ring, uh, and just really rapidly bring those systems up and test them and take them down. Now, it's nice from a, a, a management leadership uh, p position. I don't have to acquire servers for my developers to use every, to, to test everything out. Uh, they can quickly do it, tear down the system, and it's very, very cost effective for us. Um, specifically with that, we can load up 100, 200 gigabytes of test data to really start testing queries out with it in under 30 minutes. And that, it's just a, a really huge thing for us. That's primarily it. Uh, we are hiring just like every other company. Um, if you find geospatial data in Cassandra very interesting, please come talk to me. We're starting to really get into some fun analytics with this data uh, and just looking forward to, to doing everything else with it. Thank you. Any questions? What's the volume of our data? Average volume per node, Josh, do you know? Uh, 500 gigs. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things where, where we, we really wanted to move all the GPS data into Cassandra initially, but we also found it's easier to start moving new applications or, or bring new applications up on Cassandra, and that really brings the, paves the way to start migrating data over. Depend, uh, it, it's random, I, I would say. Um, certain manufacturers are better than others. Um, we've got a, a very nice relationship with the manufacturer right now, uh, and it's pretty easy. The heavy fleet vehicles are a, uh, they're more standardized than, than say your lightweight vehicles like OBD2. Those manufacturers vary very, uh, very largely. On the, the JBUS protocol, which is the heavy fleet protocol, it's a little bit more standardized with some manufacturers with very custom uh, engine fault codes and things like that. When you're talking about elevation, you said that doesn't change very often. Obviously, it doesn't for like, not long, across the world, mm -hmm. but uh, is there It could so be large. Then do you basically do like lookups off that based off the sort of data that you have stored or something? Yeah. I mean, so you're, you're kind of like doing a joint almost, right? You're grabbing data from a particular vehicle or whatever, right? Grabbing the last log and then going over to other call family to get the elevation. Is that right. Okay. Yeah, we, we can do it either off of previously stored data or we can do that lookup uh, as it's streaming in from the GSM network. 
and store that data at the same time. Yeah. Some of you can't see, that's Josh Hansen. He's our, our system architect. He, he's the brain, so. Should I just ask Go for it. <laughs> Uh, we're doing the analytics on our own, really, uh, right now. Um, what that, what we're really doing is joining multiple types of data, this elevation data, um, really big into to fuel analytics right now. So as these vehicles are driving down the road, how can we help our customers save more money by enhancing their fuel economy? That could be things such as looking at RPM ranges that the vehicle is going at as they travel down the road which is where elevation becomes very interesting. If the vehicle is driving up a steep elevation and in a, a high RPM range, can we get the driver to downshift and actually save a little bit more fuel economy? Um, it's just that joining of multiple types of data that we're really starting to get into. Most of it's all in Cassandra. It's, it's the easy way to scale and get that, data, that, uh, that read access very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't set this up with Cassandra, but I mean, potentially, obviously, once records are deleted out of there, just like it pulls it, it's going to not see anything there. Mm -hmm. So I was just curious if you guys have done Not so much in Cassandra yet. It is one of the challenges we're having to, to, to deal with, and it's, it's not going to be too hard. Um, typically, we, we store data as both a, a collected timestamp and an insert timestamp to, to deal with those types of requests. Right. Uh, nothing for our IT applications. The company is about 200 people or so now. Uh, the development team ranges, it's about 30, 35 uh, developers on staff. And then we do use some outside consulting just to, to help uh, weather the storm on uh, new applications we're working on. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been something where we've, we've had to keep some of that data in, in our, our RDBMS system. Um, with the DataStacks 3.0, we're, we're kind of excited to get more of those security privileges in there and lock the data down better and be able to migrate more of it into Cassandra. Exactly. <laughs> Tram pump, I, we'd started using Cassandra early, early on just through development cycles. Um, it did have a little bit of a learning curve and some developers are still learning to, to utilize it the best way. But it was relatively quick for a lot of developers to start accessing, especially for reads. Uh, PHP developers typically aren't writing data into Cassandra. It was very easy for them to use PHP CASA uh, and really just start reading the data and treating it like a, a typical data store. Uh, our first first application that a lot of developers were writing data within a month, month or less. So we, we've been on the road to Cassandra for, again, three, four years now. Um, but we've had a 10-node cluster running in production for about two years now. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much, everyone.